Yes, the Irish are sorry for their children and families is the subject for today. Um, I'm delighted to um, be chairing this event and to introduce um, our panel. All of us are in various stages of family life and careers and uh, I hope that we will be, be all be able to be um, a constructive part of the discussion. To my far right, uh, left, sorry, uh, is Sabrina Akhmesh. Tasmina is uh, an SNP MEP candidate. She's a candidate for this year's um, European elections. Um, she's National Women's Officer for the SNP, mother of four, lawyer, actress, and she's on the board of the yes, Scotland. So we're very delighted to welcome her to the Highlands. Thank you. <coughs> Hope you have uh, enjoyed your, your trip north. Um, next to Tasmina, we have um, Eleanor Scott, Dr. Eleanor Scott, who's from the Scottish Green Party, former co convener. MSP between 2003 and 2007. Um, mother, grandmother, and in her own words, yes, Highlands went to green. And uh, to my immediate left, uh, somebody who needs very little introduction in Mayor, uh, uh, Councillor Liz McDonald, who's represented this area since 1999. Um, Liz is married with two grown up children. Yeah. And, um, She's held the post of provost, she's now area convener, area chair, and um, a former voluntary sector uh, worker working with adults um, and carers, and has held the post of vice chair of both the Children Education Committee and the Social Work Committee within the Highland Council. So, in terms of families, um, I think we've got quite a wide breadth of um, knowledge, expertise, both professionally and um, personally. And if you excuse me, these are my three very young children. Um, and Evie would like her juice. So, what I'm going to do is ask each of the panel um, just to give us a quick five, ten minutes to chat about independence and how the issue of children and families uh, plays a part in the debate in the run up to the referendum in September. And uh, then we'll take some questions and answers, have a bit of discussion and uh, have a bit of a chat, if that's okay. Uh, would you like to kick off? Sure, sure. I sort of started, I had it in kind of a fairly formal speech, but it's not like that here. So um, I, I think it'd be great for everyone if we can have a discussion because those of us who are involved in the Yes campaign know it's very much about <coughs> conversations with people, with persuade people um, to be voting Yes. And, as I sit on the board of Yes Scotland, obviously I'm privy to a lot of the polling that goes on and the Yes Scotland's own internal polling and we are, we are at a really great point um, in our history of the Yes campaign. Um, we are polling extremely well, we are getting, uh, really people are moving along that scale. Those of you who, who canvass for Yes Scotland, obviously we have a canvas card, we have a scale of 1 to 10 and it's interesting to see how you know, we had some definite no's and definite yeses, and there was this vast void in the middle of don't know, so for a time seemed to be going towards no, but now are going back to don't know, and they are moving invariably to yes. So it's a very exciting times, and I think um, the game has changed to some extent, probably um, on the basis of the white paper, because regardless of what your political stance is, and the, and, and the great thing about the yes campaign is, of course, it involves people from various different backgrounds and political parties, and this is all about having in a democratic country for Scotland, democratic Scotland basically and everyone can vote for the government they wish once we get independence. But you know, as we're on that journey, we're all obviously seeing from the same hymn sheet in terms of um, having the ability to make choices for ourselves. And we've seen, you know, as time has gone, the white paper has come out and we have an offering. And uh, I think as Patrick Harvey put it better than anyone else in the Scottish Parliament in that debate, he said, well, this is, this is an old campaign is offering, which is absolutely nothing. Now, I'm a mum. For me, it comes naturally to me to want a positive future for my children. And that's not just me thinking about my own personal family network. We want to see a society that's moving from what appears to be just caring about your own individual set of circumstances to caring about society as a whole because our children will get the best from Scotland when as a society it's a fairer place to live in and that's one of the things um, that I'm striving for. So one of the, the EU polls that was done actually via the European organisation in terms of um, the polling from a social networking perspective, which is probably something we'll come on to, it's a very strong part of the campaign, social networking, networking um, 
is via Facebook and Twitter, we are well ahead of the game, 75% and above, um, who are yes supporters on Twitter and Facebook. And if you think about the people that goes out to, that's really important. So moving back to children and families, of course, um, the Scottish Government's commitment to childcare from one to five year olds um, is extremely an extremely important commitment and one that's taking the country in the right direction. And although, you know, I often say childcare is not a women's issue, childcare is a family issue, and it's very important that we'll see not only women being able to come back to the workplace more quickly um, and with funded childcare, but also men, because a lot of men who are stay, stay at home dads, I would be able to do a lot of the stuff that I've done in life with my husband and other people to look after the children. So it's all about putting in that support network and as an employer also, um, as a lawyer, I have a law firm and um, I cannot sing high enough the praises of women that have left to have children and come back and be able to offer to the workplace the life experiences that can take Scottish businesses forward. So that's really important. So basically we have a decision to make um, on the 18th of September. It is hugely encouraging as we go around the country speaking to different people how people have moved in the direction of thinking about it now, which is really important. A number of people will still say, where's the information, isn't enough information out there? That's because we're dealing with the media that will only put out information that suits the media. But I firmly believe that that will change, and I do believe now very much so we're dictating the terms of what's happening in the media. We've moved from the idea of whether you can retain a Scottish and British identity, which has been put to bed, to whether who the, who the debt belongs to the UK, which has been put to bed, to the EU position, which if Westminster had asked the question, will also be put to bed. I know it's, it's, it's horrific, actually, the hypocrisy um, behind all of this when we face um, on debates, and this is, of course, not one of those debates where we're, where we're arguing with each other. We're all on the same side here, uh, certainly from this side of the table. But um, the, the, the hypocrisy where we say there's no solution in relation to the pound, what's going to be uncertainty about the pound, uncertainty, uncertainty about our position in the European Union, all which can be dealt with by Westminster asking the question, which they will not do. However, we have strength, we have passion, we have commitment, we have ambition for our country, and that's what we need. As a mum, I simply cannot understand this idea of you cannot do something. Any of us who are parents will not tell our children that they can't do something, we'll tell them that they can. And as a nation, that's what we need to encourage um, our people to do. We've moved, of course, as Nicholas Sturgeon often says, from whether we can do it, because I think it's now universally accepted. Of course, Scotland can afford to be independent. Of course, we can do all of the things that any other country does. It's a natural progression for, for us from devolution to independence, to whether we should do, whether it's the right thing. When we're living now in a country governed by Westminster, where 34 or 68 years we've not voted for the government of Westminster, and where food banks is becoming common language, we should be extremely concerned about the direction our country is going in. And we're facing one in five children currently living in poverty in Scotland. We have to be questioning exactly what kind of a country we want um, for our children to be growing up in. So I'll be delighted to take questions once everyone else has the opportunity of speaking. For me, this is all about the opportunity for Scotland. It's not going to come again. We do know if there is a no vote, we can be sure that Westminster is never going to allow us to have the situation we're in right now, where we have an Edinburgh Agreement, which stipulates clearly that the governments will cooperate with each other post-independence to make sure it happens to the benefits of both countries. So we need to seize this opportunity by the means and, and go for it. And we should have faith in ourselves and in our people because we are ready to pass it. Thank you. inviting me here today to give the Green point of view. Um, thank you for turning out today, uh, especially since the forecast, although you wouldn't think it to look out at the blue sky there, the forecast was for us to be sort of under six feet of snow by now. Also thank you for using this venue, which I think is great. It's first time I've been in this building. It's a terrific building. And I, I really like the fact this room's labelled multi-purpose room. I think that kind of says it all. Really, really. Um, uh, and uh, as I, I'd said to Pauline when she said in the introduction, I'm kind of venter green. And any of you that's heard me speak at the, the previous YES meetings, please just tune out because I'll probably say a lot of the same things I'm beginning to think, you know, actually I've heard myself say this before. Um, but the Scottish Green Party is part of YES Scotland, they are also registered as a, an independent campaigning organisation, just in case we fall out with everybody and want to do our own campaign, which is a bit of a lapse with no money to do it. 
But um, we believe in independence. We're not nationalists, but we believe in it from the point of view of appropriate levels of decision making. Um, certain decisions obviously have to be made internationally. You know, ideally at, at worldwide level, probably realistically at the moment, at the European level at least. And decisions about human rights and, and environmental protection, and perhaps about common security, where nation states don't always get it right and need an overarching decision. Equally, there are lots of decisions that should be made a lot more locally than they are now, at street level, at community level, um, at the level of, dare I say, a much smaller council area, and um, much more local decision making. And we would support that as well. And for us, independence, you know, the, the um, shift of power wouldn't, wouldn't stop. The day after, uh, uh, yes, well, we want a lot more devolution of power within Scotland. And there are decisions that are to be made at nation state level about defence policy, about tax and benefits and so on. And we think Scotland is the appropriate size for that. There are lots, plenty of examples. Um, maybe I'll be the first to say the S word in Scandinavian countries. Because it's always one of the sort of tenets of Dean philosophy that you can always say, whatever you ask, you can always say, well, there's a very good example in Scandinavia. <laughs> and there are plenty of those to show that small countries can, can do well um, by themselves with, with their own decision making powers. Now, I said I've been kind of venting, I was at a meeting earlier this week at Monday and <coughs> down in, <coughs> excuse me, in, in Aviemore. And one of the speakers was Jean Arker, MSP, and I was very struck by something she said because she was talking about the, the sort of fact that people think of that political union that the United Kingdom has is, is kind of the normal situation. And in fact, there was mention of one lady down in Bacon, in, who's you know, 101, and determined to hang on in there to, to, to vote in the referendum. And for somebody that her, there are lots of people who live to be 100 now, there's just three lifetimes that we've been in the union. It's not a long-standing thing in Scotland's history. Three lifetimes of these people there. And that started making me think about, particularly about the position of women, because when you're talking about children and families, you have to talk about women's place in society and what's happened and the changes that made, and the choices, because it's about choices, I think, the choices that women have had over the years. I remember my great-grandmother, she didn't quite make it to be um, 100, she made it to 99, so she died when I was in my teens. She was born in 1868. So I'm like three degrees of separation from somebody that was born in 1868, 50 years before women got the vote. And her choices in life were really limited. She had left school went into domestic service because her family weren't well off. But you know, if her family had been rich, she'd have had a much easier, more comfortable life, but probably actually not any more choices. And she, she ended up that she just had two children because she was widowed young, so that was probably the reason for that. But really women had very few choices as to what role they took in life, as to where their position in society was, and as to what size of a family they had to, you know, family family. And her daughter, my grandmother, was born in 1895. And she ended up with a lot more choices, probably because she lived through the First World War, where choices were dumped on women because the society didn't have any choice, and women ended up doing things. I'm not quite sure what my grandfather did in the war, but I, I know like, a great aunt of mine, a contemporary, I've got a picture of her working in a musician's factory, for example. Of course, after that, that war, men could no longer say that women couldn't do things. They might still say women shouldn't be doing certain things and, and taking certain career paths, but they couldn't any longer say they couldn't do it because they'd been doing it for those years. But she, when women got the vote in 1918, my grandmother was then 23. She didn't have that vote because, of course, initially women got the vote at 30, not in the same terms as men at 21. When my mother was born in 1920, that was eight years before women got the vote on the same terms as men. So if you look at the societal changes that, you know, this is the mother that, I, I, that brought me up, and she was born before this happened, before this basic democratic equality happened. And um, my grandmother had five children and I think she probably wouldn't have chosen to have five children had you know family planning been around to the same extent. My mother who left school just before the, uh, the Second World War had a lot more choices. But even then to me her choices were quite limited. She went into the civil service which was thought of um, my family in those days as, as the ultimate thing that they did about security and all this. But when she got married you left your job. You know, there wasn't a choice. It was a little thing. You left, yeah. Um, you, you, you left. Well, I don't think she was too bothered, but you know, she might have liked to have the choice. And then when I grew up in, as a, in the um, 50s, 60s, well, I left school in 1968, so it was around the bit. Um, I became politically aware in the middle of it. 
I'm going to say this quietly, the moment that I joined the Labour Party, I couldn't help it. My best pal's dad was a Labour councillor, and you know, at that time it was like socialism and the and the Green Party didn't exist, so it wasn't my fault really, but I can remember <laughs> canvassing um, in the elections then, and still in those days, canvassing would be bits of Glasgow. They used to send the young people up to the stairs because a lot of the party activists were a bit older to do it. And you'd still knock on doors and ask somebody, people, if they thought about how they were going to vote, and if it was a woman, it, it was quite common to get this all up to see what my husband says. You know, so people get choices, but don't always actually actually use them. But I had loads of choices, you know, um, to leave school, to go to university, because there were grants in those days. And, you know, all, all, all sorts of choices you expect. Not all the choices, that, that some, some of the choices have progressed, and some of them, I think, have gone back. The, the, the going to university, but because of course you don't get grants anymore, it's a lot harder than that. But when I was at school, even in the late 60s, um, girls did sewing and cookery, and boys did woodwork and metal work. Now, I don't know whether I did any metal woodwork when I was at sewing. I was useless at the band using my sewing machines. But I might have been a pilot of that choice. My daughter finds that very really nice and laughable. She thinks she'd grown up now. But it just shows you the difference that just three, gen three or four generations of the choices that have been available for women. And I, I bring this up because I think what's important in people's lives is choices. I mean, we've obviously got a choice which people would die for, in fact, some parts of the world have to die for, to, to create a country on the model that you want to go, and, and to incorporate all these choices and, and the human rights and all the things that you should have in it. And I'm going to throw out one out, straight out of the Green Party manifesto, just to, because it won't, you won't get it in the Scottish future, Scotland's future government um, document, because it's not government policy. And it's fair enough that Scotland's future should be written by the government. It's a government document. The government has an elected mandate. They'll be doing the negotiations after a yes vote. They'll be, they'll, you know, their view of society will inform the first, the, the initial um, discussions as to as to how Scotland gets, the new Scotland gets set up. But for other parties, I'm going to throw something into the mix. Because quite often, some of these, like you get studies from the Institute of Fiscal Studies and people that say how much it would cost to run Scotland. And that kind of very much presupposes you're going to run it like we run the UK now. But there are things you can do differently. And one of the things that encouraged me in the Scotland's Future document, not all of which I have read, I just like to see how thick it is and it's too heavy to read in bed, but I read the bits that interested me, the bits about the, the powers that we don't have at the moment. And the one that interests me was the tax and benefits system, because we've got this really clunky system which can be very hard on families, hard on families that are in low incomes, hard on families that are, are really struggling, with, where the parents, one or both parents, would like to work, but you know, their earning power is such that they might be better off in benefits and so on. You know, you all know the story. One of the things that it says in that document is they would like to greatly simplify the system. And that did encourage me because we have a proposal for a very simple system and throwing this into the mix. One of the choices we'll have in the first election after a Scottish Parliament is a thing called citizens' income. Like all the best green ideas, we didn't think it up. Um, somebody else did, and there's a citizens' income trust that promotes the idea. But basically, what you do is you take the, 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 the sort of benefits that anybody would get by that, and not the disability benefits, but benefits, you know. Um, family tax credits, but unemployment benefits, job supplies allowance, the, the sort of benefits that any of us, if we find ourselves in need, would be entitled to without having to be particularly assessed. And we also take the personal tax allowance, which is the amount that you're allowed to earn before you start paying tax. And we put that together and we say citizens income. And that's an amount that should be enough to live on, not enough to be make poopy on, but enough enough to keep body and soul together. And you have that as a right. So it replaces these benefits, it replaces the tax allowance, so when you start working, you start paying tax and everything you earn. But it's much similar to administer. All you need to know basically is your name, your date of birth, and where you live. And you get your, your citizens' income. They already have it for children as well, <coughs> child benefit. You know, if a child gets that, so the idea is that that child benefit would, when they get into their teens, increase until it reaches the adult level of the citizens' income. Much simpler to administer, needs much less of an apparatus of state, abolishes the poverty trap because you can then choose whether you want to work full time, part time, whether you want to take a break, become a carer, go back to study, whatever. It's a, it's a very elegant solution to a lot of the problems that keep people in poverty. And that's just one of the choices you will have. And I've put that down not because I'm trying to get you all to vote for me, although I am, but, <laughs> but because to illustrate that. When we're looking at the kind of Scotland we have, we have these choices, it can extend much more. You know, 
Theoretically, we could argue, and we do argue, as, as Green's Persistent Zoom from Westminster Law Book, in practice, there's such a huge established apparatus of state, there's a big sort of state juggernaut that's really hard to stop and turn and make it go in the direction. Starting up with a new country, a new independent country where people are going to be excited and are going to really look at what they want. We, have, we really have all these choices, and that will impact on families, it will impact on women, and then equally it will impact on her sort of society, our children will grow up with the sort of choices they're going to have. And that's what I want to see, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's really, not only that we should vote yes, but it's really exciting to be voting yes. Presentation there, making the points for and against an independent Scotland, because arguably this is the biggest decision they're going to have to make in 30 years, and it will be the first time that any of them have voted on anything. You know, it's their first time they're voting, so they have to understand all the implications of that vote, because it will be a long time before we get a second chance to have a vote like this. I think we've got an ideal opportunity where we are with the Scottish Government. They have done all the background work. We've got Scotland's future here, which Eleanor's correct, it's a weighty document. Um, but there's a summary document just been made available, and it's a 33-page document which outlines the high points of this very weighty book. And I've got the phone number here, it's 03000121809, if anyone would like to order a copy. And it's delivered free to your house, and you know, there's a lot of reading. I mean, I admit I haven't read through it all, but I've dipped in and out of it. And I have thought as well, you know, one thing that's important for our future is the defence of our country. And although... Um, it's maybe not, it's something that I get asked quite a lot on the doorstep and it uh, seems to be quite a big issue. Um, when you look in the document it says here quite clearly that uh, the latest figure for defence spending in Scotland is £1.4 billion pounds less than Scotland's current contribution of £3.3 billion for UK defence. So, I mean, in our party, we've got our policy for putting in, I think it's 2.4 million into defence in Scotland and focusing it on our 
peaceful now, isn't it? <laughs> it's a shame Pauline felt she had to take her children out. Um, I think, because people, are not, it's not only about the future, it's about um, our safety, our security, about doing what's right for our communities. And, and I think it's also a big job in engaging with young people. I've been trying through my role as a counsellor to try and make sure that Scotland Future is in all our secondary schools. And I'm hoping that we can get some guidance from the Scottish Government. I think young people to make their decision, they have to know what the important issues are. And I think that's all we can really do is try and spread the word. I think we all believe very firmly on this top table that it's the way to go, it's the way to have a brighter future in Scotland. And um, we just need to keep getting the word out there because we don't get help from national press or from the BBC. And it's through coming to events like this, speaking to folk and speaking on the doorstep that we can hear what your concerns are and how we can best fulfill your needs and wishes in our new school. Three speakers. I'm now opening to questions. And, you know, just listening to these speakers, is this bit is about excitement, is about change, is about Scotland's potential. It's looking for to kind of you know rich ways of being a country. And I don't mean rich in terms of wealth. I just mean rich in terms of society. Different ways of doing things. I was up at the CAB stand up at Sainsbury's yesterday, and they were talking about you know energy watch and basically you know going online, making sure that you're not paying more in terms of you know electricity and gas prices than you need to. And I saw Danny with his big scissors, and uh, uh, it's just a pity he keeps cutting uh, the things that matter most to people in Scotland with these big scissors of his. Uh, but you know various speakers talking there. You think about the kind of country Scotland could have been if 40 years ago it was voted yes. You know, you think about the energy policy. Would Scotland have privatised its electricity, its gas? It wouldn't have. You know, we know we wouldn't have gone into Iraq into an illegal war behind 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 Tony Blair. But there's lots of other things we wouldn't have done. We still have our water. We own our water. It's there. We've got issues about the costs of it, whatever. But it's ours and we own it. Step across the border, it's privatised as well. It's like electricity and gas. We've had these wee opportunities to do things differently. And I guess on the 18th of September, we'll get such an opportunity to do loads of things differently, better, fairer, on the alternative. Over to questions uh, for any of all the